Good morning, nerd fam, and welcome back to Palo Alto, California. Very excited to be here for a special edition, Super Cloud 7. We are getting ready for the next data platform. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by the fabulous John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Thank you both so, for being yeah, here. This yeah. is actually my first time with both of you in the studio together. Yeah. It's awesome. fun. I'm yeah. excited about it's it. It's always good to be live in Palo Alto in the studio yeah. and, and doing super clouds, seven super clouds, Savannah and John. It's amazing, yeah. this, uh, this series. And of course, we use it as an umbrella for all the hot topics of the day and nothing hotter than data. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and, and all the data nerds are very excited to hear that. You've got some exciting research you're going to be presenting later. Yeah. I believe we have 15 guests today. John, who are you most excited to hear from today? Ali Gotzi is going to be keynoting at 1 o'clock. He's going to come in live, and that's going to be very notable. Ben Woff from Snowflake, the co-founder, chief product officer over there. So we got Snowflake and Databricks both here. I'm excited for both of them because the survey that's groundbreaking that we're announcing uh, this week, Dave did a preview on his breaking analysis, really um, is the survey of surveys, in my opinion, in this industry, because we've been saying data's going to be changing, the script is flipping, we're going to see Gen AI change the data layer completely, especially with all the infrastructure gains. And this, this survey is the first survey, in my opinion, I've seen that is a tell sign of what we've been saying is actually happening and there's a platform shift going on and, and it absolutely targets what's going to happen next as the infrastructure gets better. We'll be at supercomputing in 24. You'll see probably new GPU formats there, more hardware. So as infrastructure closes the loop and gets stronger, the data layer is going to change very rapidly and the data is clear that this is evidently happening right now in the market. So this, this should be a really great a set of experts really unpacking and then and commentating on this trend. So I think the survey is very telling um, and we will be speculating on what it means for the companies involved and of course the customers. Yeah, and, and I mean, with all data has been such a hot topic, both in the good and bad, we're still on the back end of CrowdStrike, we're still on the back end of a lot of chaos. Users have been experiencing the negative impacts of when their data or their systems are are attacked or negatively impacted. I'm curious, Dave, what do you, why, how do you think our, our guests are going to be thinking about the end user? I know we think a lot about the systems and the hardware and the software. What do you think we're going to hear about the people? So I, first I, I would say that the good far outweighs the bad, but the bad gets a lot of headlines, of course. Right. And of course tech gets, gets blamed. But I think that if you think <laughs> yeah, about so. the last 10 years in, in data, it's gotten much better. You think about fraud detection. Mm -hmm. um, you think about uh, just even you know advertising. You get much better advertising. That's not necessarily a good thing, but maybe it is, a, is an okay thing for consumers. Um, you, you'd rather not get you know spammed with things that you don't care about, mm -hmm. and we still get that. And so there's still some work to be done there. Uh, but so there are many examples of goodness that data brings. And but the last ten years, Savannah have brought a complete change in the way we do analytics because of the cloud. It wasn't obvious at the time when, you know, the likes of Snowflake separated compute from storage, put it in the cloud, you had infinite resources. 100%. And, and but point. that completely changed the technology landscape. And now we're entering yet another data, the sort of what yeah. we call the next data platform. Sometimes we call it the sixth data platform. Why is that important? It's important because we're going to see a whole new layer of intelligent applications emerge where businesses are going to sort of re-architect their processes and you're going to have a digital representation of your organization, people, places, things, and it's going to affect supply chain, logistics, you, you know, weather, uh, mm -hmm. all of these factors are going to be brought to bear and you're going to see a whole new suite of applications that emerge that are going to bring benefit to consumers, to organizations, to businesses, and to society. I think, any, oh, go ahead, John. I think the CrowdStrike, you brought that up as a great yeah. example because that also shows the revolution of the shift in cybersecurity. CrowdStrike is known as a cybersecurity company, but that incident had nothing to do with security. Exactly. It was a disruption. And that points out why we're at SuperCloud 7 is focused on this next data platform because that's the confluence of data and DevOps and operations, so that's where AI could come in. So I think the CrowdStrike really is about more about Microsoft, their system. So that just goes to show you that the data platform is a systematic issue and the data, the CrowdStrike is getting blamed for it. And it wasn't even a security breach, but that was a DevOps, that was a data upload and that was the process and that's where the cloud technologies and that's why the cloud is so critical to this discussion because cloud and the data platforms are going to be integrated and the AI apps running on them 
is what's going to be the big focus of this conversation today. And again, the survey will point out, you'll see when we unpack it, Dave will um, do a great analysis that the data and the cloud technologies are going to be key. And by the way, cloud on premise too, is going to be a big part of the discussion. So I think the crowd strike is we all saw that as a Y2K moment, if you will, or like, it wow. Totally, it absolutely it, it was. It was like, everything's crashing, but it was, had nothing to do with cybersecurity. It was data that was being uploaded and DevOps hygiene wasn't there. The system we talk about it all the time. On collateral the show. damage was huge. That was a cloud technology data process issue. That was a platform issue around both CrowdStrike uploading data to Microsoft systems, and that had nothing to do with security. But data was the key. I think it's worth going back a little bit in time and, and help the audience understand the progression in data and data platforms. John, I go back to 2010 mm -hmm. at the second Hadoop World, our first Hadoop mm -hmm. World on the Cube, and Mike Olson came in the Cube and he said. Back, we asked him to do a little Hadoop 101. He said, back in the day, <laughs> you would buy a big honking Sun server, you'd attach some EMC storage, you'd throw a bunch of Oracle licenses, and if you had any money left over, you know, you might start developing applications on top of it. And essentially what that was, is you'd build a data warehouse, and there were maybe two or three people in the organization that were you know, smart enough to actually use that data warehouse, and it took right. forever. You'd have people in the business saying, hey, I need this analysis. And they'd say, okay, I'll get back to you in a month. And by then the market had shifted. So what Hadoop, the promise of Hadoop was it going to change all that. What, what Hadoop really did is it lowered the cost of stuffing a bunch of data you know, in storage. Mm -hmm. And you still needed you know, people in lab coats to figure all this stuff out. Right. And then Databricks and Snowflake really started to popularize the simplification of that data platform. And that's where we were saying, you see much better analytics, much better things like fraud detection and, and so many other you know, use cases mm -hmm. in financial services and healthcare and manufacturing. Now we're entering a new era, and it's really, you know, Ali Goetze talks about democratizing all this data. You've got all this data, all distributed. You've got now AI injected, mm -hmm. new types of AI injected into the system. And so what the, the next data platform is all about, whereas the, the current modern data platform was about mm -hmm. separating compute from storage and doing everything in the cloud. The next data platform is all about allowing any compute engine any, it doesn't matter what it is, to get to any data. Mm -hmm. So it's opening up, it's, it's about opening up the data elements, making them coherent, and then building new intelligent applications on top of that. It's just, it's, it's impossible to predict what kind of applications, but I will tell you they will be yeah. amazing, like nothing we've ever seen before. I think, I think you just described that really well, Dave, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. It's as if <clears throat> this last revolution was all about getting data and, and analysis actually real time what not waiting weeks for this. Yes, for real this time. Is yeah. Key phrase. So we, we had to come up to real time and a, and a lot of systems are still getting there. I think where we're headed next is this anticipatory or this preemptive or this forecasting or, or predicting what we're going to need or want or crave in a given moment. And so the, these apps can go and look at that data and yeah. figure out what. I, I give me an example. Today there are hundreds of billions of dollars of waste spent on supply chain. Mm -hmm. And the way that the industry handles it is they build up inventory. And that's just it's a waste. And so if you ever you know, get frustrated because you're supposed to get an order show up and it shows up in pieces, mm -hmm. that's, that problem is going to go away because people will be able to, to your point, in real time, they'll mm -hmm. be able to yeah. anticipate problems. They'll be able to anticipate weather changes and, and heat waves in the Northeast in May and they'll be able to ship more you know, yeah. air conditioners that way. Things like that are going to become uh, just second nature in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things about the SuperCloud 7, it's interesting is the timing of it is, um, you mentioned looking back. If you look back the past year, okay, uh, and go back to even supercomputing uh, last year, Savannah, when we were seeing the HPC and AI merge, and then look at all the events that happened and look at the stock market. NVIDIA, Broadcom, yeah. Chips. We're going to have <clears throat> Matt Garman here on the Cube on August 16th for exclusive. We'll talk to him. All the infrastructure players are absolutely racing to create innovation and differentiation around performance. So, yeah. and we've been saying on theCUBE that thesis has been, okay, what happens after that? So that's going to happen. Maybe the stock prices level out, but the next curve comes in, that next inflection point on a platform. Well, like Jensen Wong and NVIDIA call it a platform shift at GTC. Mm -hmm. AI factories, Dell's talking right. about it too. Okay, so now platform shift in the data world's happening too. So it's a market shift and product shift. So today we're going to unpack that. I think the survey points to the fact that both the market shift and the product shift is happening. And if you look at Databricks and Snowflake in the survey, they have different products positioning, kind of doing the same thing. So that means that the shift from analytics 
to data platforms, data engineering is happening. And again, developer first market is emerging. These are the things we've been saying. Again, the survey points to what we've been saying and this is why I'm so excited Savannah because if you have a market and platform shift happening at the same time, mm -hmm. that means everybody's at risk. It's an opportunity for every player. And I think the dominant player, Snowflake and Databricks will do well. I think Google BigQuery will, will probably rise up and Azure will get a nice slice of that too, as will Amazon Redshift. So product market shift, really exciting time for us because it's more media to continue. You guys talk about market shifts. I want to tell you a story. I was driving over here with the, the Lyft driver when he was telling him, he asked me what we did. I told him about SuperCloud and theCUBE. And he said, is there a shadow recession going on in tech right now? And I said, why do you ask that? And he said, well, I, I'm in tech, I'm a recruiter. And, and I went from feast to famine. And I can't place anybody, I can't get a gig. And, and you know, what's going on? And we've seen this before in other shifts. When the new thing comes in, it's not throwing off enough cash uh, to offset the decline in the old thing. Right. And, and what, you, what happens is you get this sort of vacuum, this gap, mm -hmm. and it gets really confusing. And you have a few big winners, mentioned yeah. NVIDIA, obviously the hyperscalers, companies like Broadcom, you know, Dell, others, you know, kick and butt. But there's a lot of other uncertainty going on with spending. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you know, it kicks in and you get yeah. the steep part of the S-curve. And that's exactly what's happening now. It happened from mainframes to PCs. Yeah. It, it definitely happened with the internet. It happened with the cloud. Didn't happen so much with mobile and social. That was more incremental. Yeah. There's definitely a shift going on right now in yeah. spending and mindset and confusion in, this, in the customer base. Can AI do what uh, my software can do? And right. Hold on, tap the brakes right. on that spending. And what's actually making us money. Right, and, then, and that's what you're seeing now. Yeah. And then there's this going to be this space where there's a lot of confusion and then all of a sudden it kicks in and it, and it lives up to its promise. It's an interesting data point about the jobs. My, 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 two of my kids graduated last year and a lot of their friends can't get jobs right now. In Silicon Valley and in tech, and generally entry level jobs, jobs are hard because people have been downsizing. So they're staying within. It is a tough job market. And I think you're right on because the tide is in between high tide, low tide. So I think when this thing settles, we need a bit to flip. And I think as the silicon gets better and as that infrastructure kicks in, we're seeing it very clearly in the survey, Developer platforms with generative AI applications are coming, intelligent apps, and that's why all the action is around all this nerdy content around open data formats, yep. governance. I mean, if we talked open data formats and governance five years ago, people would have been sleeping. Okay? Quite literally. Like, like, I mean, literally it's the most boring topic, but it's so critical Front at the foundation mind. levels of everything. So again, the survey points directly to that, these key things in the system architecture are, are the top I, conversations. I think you both bring up really interesting points and thank you to your Lyft driver for prompting us in this, <laughs> in this dialogue because you write about the gap and I think, I think there's two things happening. I think there's a reckoning because these companies were a bit bloated and overvalued in certain cases on the software side. We weren't, the numbers just didn't make sense. So of course there's unfortunately human catastrophe within that from the workforce uh, perspective. And they overhired. Yeah, right. Exactly, that's what I mean. They, 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 were, they were bloated. There, there, there needed to be a, a reckoning, a riding of the ship. There was just too many people on board and there was no way to scale with numbers that weren't matching that in terms of customer value and, and a lot of other things with most of these companies that we're talking about. So that part of it doesn't surprise me. But the other thing is investments in AI are extraordinarily expensive. It's not like buying another, it, it's, it's, it's even more expensive than some of the other technological investments. I mean, new technology is always expensive, but when we're talking about the, the hardware cost here, the power cost here, it's an order of magnitude more expensive than some of the other prototypes and experiments these companies have done in the past. Yeah. So I think, I think it's interesting to, to see, I think that'll toggle it a little harder than it Well, some quick data from the survey, yeah. which we'll, we'll go into detail later, but on the, on the survey of the joint Databricks Snowflake accounts, 96% of the respondents that have these shared accounts, Databricks Snowflake, are deeply involved in the data platform decision making. Okay, you go back five years on analytics. That That's was da hard. that was dashboarding. Okay, then you say yeah. you mentioned you mentioned um, importance. The key issues that we're watching, we've been saying this with, with the cloud. Which workloads are going to adopt Gen AI? So right now, if you look at Snowflake and Databricks as the proxy, as well as BigQuery and the other ones, the workload distribution of how those apps are going to run, and then how the customers are strategically aligning with the company. So in other words, you'll see the survey data when we get into it, that they pick Snowflake for this and Databricks for that, but they're not replacing them. The loyalty for both platforms are significantly high, Dave. You pointed out in your breaking analysis. So the strategic alignment and then workload distribution. 
those will determine who does what. So it's, it literally is for who can swim out faster to the, to the dock and claim the, the AI, AI mantle trophy. So, you know, that's going to be, you know, going to be developers, Dave. I mean, and, we've been saying it. And that's why in the breaking analysis was kind of politically correct, but it seemed to be true in the data that we called it not a zero sum game. But I wanted to just make a point um, and, and um, ask our audience to really pay attention to our next guest, Jamak Dagani, who we pre-recorded uh, last week. She came in from Australia. Jamak Dagani is, she's an amazing thought leader. She created the concept of data mesh and she is going to lay out one of these transitions mm -hmm. that's occurring. And oh, so cool. what she does is she has this wonderful picture of, look at the data pipeline. We have all this data that we ingest. We have all these hyper-specialized uh, people to do things, data engineers, data scientists, data analysts. And we put the data into some kind of data store. And then we realize uh, we can't really get value out of it. So we have to bring in this metadata and we have technical metadata and we have this business metadata. And then we get that and then we realize, oh, we have to govern it. So we have to bring in a governance layer. So she goes through beautifully all these things that we do and it takes forever. By the end of it, the market's changed. So same problem that we yeah. had with back in the old data warehouse days. And so that whole data pipeline is going to get disrupted to John's point with open data formats. The big question, the big theme that we're going to talk about today at SuperCloud 7 is how do you govern that? And that's yeah. the that's the big yeah. jump ball. It's and awesome. spending shifts. And, Talk about the and how that impacts yes. the spending yes. spending shifts. So imagine that complicated yeah. data pipeline getting dramatically simplified in a distributed fashion, democratizing that data, putting data and AI in the hands of business users that can actually create, you know, not only data products, yeah. but new applications on top of that with low code and no code. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. that we're ent entering a new world and it's yeah. highly disruptive to all that investment billions and billions of dollars that have built up in data pipelines and business intelligence and dashboards yeah. that's going to get blown away. I get asked all the time why we keep talking about open data formats and governance. Uh, and we had Yasmin on from Google. Um, a lot of that pipelining is going to be done with generative AI. So all that heavy lifting around ETL and data yeah. pipelining will probably be done by agents. Um, Okay, that, that aside, and I, I respond like, well, it's kind of nerdy, it's in the weeds, but it's like an operating system. You got to get down to the low levels, open data formats and governance. If, with, if you don't get that right, then everything else might fail because the future of the data platforms as we've been reporting is data is a proprietary asset. So on the business side, it's proprietary, mm -hmm. which means it is value and it has to be programmable. Okay. And as developers start programming with this the data, the asset, things like latency, these things come into play because if data doesn't get to the application, oh, it's it hallucinates and or things happen. So the, the business value is the data asset as proprietary resource and then programmability. Those things don't happen unless data is available, mm -hmm. which is open data formats, and the governance can build in the security layer. So this control plane, control points mm -hmm. become big. So the, all the, the secret battles are going on right now in the industry and the survey again points this out when you look at the questions that you guys put together from the Cube Research, I thought you guys did an amazing job with ETR on that. So it is a, it's a survey of all surveys. It's, it's very kind of nuanced, but all the tell signs are in there, Savannah. So, yeah. so just to sort of geek out for a second. So everything used, the control point used to be in the database. It still is if you're Oracle, but for everybody else, it's <laughs> shifting. Yeah. Um, and this is why it's interesting to juxtapose Snowflake and Databricks strategy. So it's shifting from the database, the DBMS, to the governance catalog, that layer. But the value is not shifting there because that a lot of that governance catalog is getting open sourced. So the value is shifting to intelligent applications on that are getting built on top of these, these platforms that can use AI and bring together mm -hmm. these, these intelligent tool chains to create new apps. And yeah. so this is a really interesting dynamic. If you're Snowflake, you want to hold on to that DBMS value. If you're Databricks, which you never, you know, that's not your history, your history is in ML and AI, you want to blow that away. Ali Goetze is very famous for saying, don't give your data to any vendor, including Databricks. We're going to ask him about that. Why would he say yeah. that? Because he got a completely different strategy. Snowflake strategy was always give us your data and we'll govern it. So like John was saying, 
See, five years ago, you talk about open table formats, people go, well, who cares, right? Who are, governance, who cares? Yeah, change the right? channel. <laughs> right. Now it's like front and center because of AI and responsible yeah. AI and, and legal issues and compliance issues. Governance is first, it's priority yeah. one. Governance and security, priority one and two. Yeah, and an interesting, the only 15% only of the respondents are currently using open table formats, so open table formats, so that's going to rise significantly or not, we'll see. But 70% say, they're intending to use them or you know, digging in. And so that's there's yeah. a big chunk of people there's that are tons maybe. of headroom. There's I a think, lot of maybes. I think well, even by the time we'll I, I think even by the time we're at KubeCon or supercomputing, we'll have much more I, I bet we'll see that number shift even between in the next nine years. Oh, no doubt. I, I'm confident that's an acceleration curve. One thing I want to point out that I think is kind of fun in this banter, and I really liked this about your analysis and the survey data and, and, and it not being a, a zero sum game is it's not just these companies in the market that's going to benefit, it's developers that are going to benefit as a result of all of these players competing. The developer experience is going to have to be optimum for these engines to move at the velocity they'll need to, to be competitive. And I think it's kind of nice. And that's the market shift, that's the key. And, and you know, I love to dig in the data and try to connect the dots. One of the things that jumped out at me was we would saying developer first for a year now, that's mm -hmm. clearly evident. Mm -hmm. Data's an asset, that's happening. But if you look at, we always would say Databricks versus Snowflake. It's actually not about Databricks versus Snowflake because it's actually Databricks and Snowflake versus BigQuery, <laughs> Azure, and Amazon. The and the hyperscaler survey comes out exactly. there. Exactly. When we, when, we, when we asked, when the Cube Research and ETR asked the, the customers, um, will they phase out Snowflake or Databricks? It was a significantly low single digit number that they were going to switch from one to the other or right. phase them out. The switchings were a little bit higher on Databricks side because of the ML. But so that tells me two things. One is loyalty for those platforms means they have a moat. Two, the market's bigger. Databricks is getting the more of the AI ML developer piece. Mm -hmm. Snowflake has that traditional data warehouse market. So as the market rises, so if the market grows, they both win significantly because of the loyalty. So the question is not going to be Databricks versus Snowflake, it's going to be Databricks versus Snowflake versus BigQuery. Well, versus you noticed Redshift. in that survey, um, when asked, you know, which ones are you going to sort of who do you think has the best ML AI capabilities? Databricks won, you know, they were yeah. obviously leaning yeah. mostly that way. These are joint customers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, data, uh, Snowflake was, was next in line, again, joint customers. Hyperscalers were considered by 30% of the customers to have better ML AI capabilities. Not surprising, but still to your point, that could be a blind spot. And I want to go back to something you said about developers because, and I want to come back to Jamak Dagani. She comes at it from the developer on. And one of the things that the survey data was very clear on, there's probably not going to be one governance catalog or layer to rule them all. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have multiple governance catalogs and Jamak will say, that's going to be a potential bottleneck yeah. for people. Our words, not hers. She's being politically correct. But, but that's a problem. If you have to manage all these different governance layers, that's where she's adding value because yeah. her whole intent of her company is to make that developer experience much more simplified yeah. so that they can build intelligent data apps that change the world. And these are the companies yeah. that are going to win. Yeah. You Right and, we, and we we had a, a data dog interview just recently uh, this past month, uh, the chief product officer, and I think Savannah, you were on the cube when we coined the term um, B to D, business to developer. Yes. This market of business to developer is emerging, and I think that's going to be where the apps are going to kind of play in. Yeah. Nicely. Well, gentlemen, we are going to get even deeper into that survey data and learn a lot from our fabulous guests. John and Dave, thank you so much for having me here today for yep, Fabulous great. Super Cloud 7. Yeah, and great analysis. Though. I hope that you are all ready for the next data platform because we're going to be talking about it all day. Stay tuned here on theCUBE. My name is Savannah Peterson here in Palo Alto, California. Hope you're having a beautiful day.